send uh, a copy to Facebook because we found that uh, the the, um, the viewer on YouTube are much more comfortable um, uh, to do that on YouTube rather than on Facebook. Okay. Now, okay, the webinar, the media webinar. Okay, now, okay. Excellent, excellent job, well done, well done. Uh, now we start the business in, in two minutes exactly, we'll start because our success is due to our punctuation and uh, it is, uh, we, are, we are running on two minutes, we'll be on time. We had more than 100 sessions, and uh, I never, I had never uh, been a moderator, and uh, I hope you will be patient to me today, and uh, I, have, I, I have to do a good job. Uh, thank you so much. And I hope I will do a good job. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, now, now uh, you have a very good start tonight. We have more than 40 colleagues attending your um, nice lectures. And uh, Muhammad bin Masoud, thank you so much. Uh, Muhammad Sulaiman, thank you so much. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I will start now. Yes, I will start now. If you allow me, uh, uh, if you allow me, uh, um, dear colleagues and uh, panelists, uh, thank you so much for attending tonight. Uh, this is uh, the MEGA Learning Webinar. We are, uh, I'm so honored to be the moderator of this uh, session tonight uh, with the two eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Sudetta Makareji and uh, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nas. We will start with uh, Dr. Uh, Sudetta. Uh, he is a critical uh, uh, care consultant and uh, uh, excuse me one second here now. And uh, he is uh, has a MD in critical care and uh, Indian Critical Care Medicine Fellowship, and uh, he is a consultant of Critical Care Medicine Department, Tata Medical uh, Center, Calcutta in India, uh, since 2017 to date. Uh, working as an instructor of the basic points of care ultrasound, as you know, that is a focus, but he worked with Wayne Focus in uh, his representative in India. He's assessor of the Nathan Accreditation Board the Hospital and the National Acquisition Board of our hospital and the healthcare provider in India. He's a reviewer in Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine and uh, a Journal of Anesthesia and the Critical Care, Care Case Report. He is working co in collaboration with Indian Council, Medical Council Research on different projects as primary investigators, especially in hospital infection control. Uh, he won the Young Talent Hunt uh, in 2019 award by the Society of the Critical Care Medicine. He is organizer of the medical uh, mechanical ventilation courses. And as you see, he's endless CV, and uh, I would get his time for the lecture if you allow me to go with his uh, CV and uh, with a short, that's very short resume. He's a trainer for management of the COVID-19 pneumonia program. And he, as you see that he has been published in uh, books chapter more than 16. Um, Dr. Sudetta tonight is going to uh, speak to us about critical care challenges after major abdominal surgery. Uh, on your behalf, I would like to welcome Dr. Sudetta Mukherjee uh, for his uh, lecture tonight. And thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much for, uh, uh, for him uh, tonight to give us this lecture. Thank you. 
good evening dr saad dr nasir and all the esteemed delegates thank you dr saad for for nice words and for giving me the opportunity to uh, present uh, this in this excellent academic forum and this mega education program is going great and i wish you and the whole team lot of success by this i like to start today's presentation and today's talk is about critical care challenges after major abdominal surgery now if you look up the major abdominal surgeries that involves starting with the bowel resection like gastrectomy small bowel and colon resection maybe a pancreatic hepatobiliary surgery gynecological surgery which includes cyto reduction in terms of either primary debulking or secondary debulking after chemotherapy maybe urogenital surgery that includes extensive radical cystoprostatectomy and along with this there are some special cases called hypex when after cyto reduction there is a heat with chemotherapy added to the peritoneal cavity and there are challenges related to the chemotherapy also related to the hypothermia so when you talk about the critical care admission about these post op patients when they are in invasive ventilation or they are requiring vasopressor support like noradrenaline this is very obvious for them to come to the icu for for initial monitoring but except that there are times these patients after major surgery from or directly come to icu for monitoring because if the surgical team feels that there are a lot of comorbidities for anesthesia to be feels that the cardiac function or the other things are little borderline and can deteriorate because of the surgical stress in the post operative period on on the other hand sometimes the this patient get an emergency admission to icu from the ward because of acute deterioration and they are requiring organ support beyond this some of the planned surgeries also come to icu for organ support when there is something goes accord not goes according to the plan like may, may, maybe a massive bleed maybe a vital organ injury maybe a vascular injury maybe patient develop a perioperative cardiac event or respiratory issue after some transfusion those patients also come to icu for organ support so now how you can utilize a critical care facility specifically in a country like india to its best possible limit that means we need to identify the patients who really need critical care support and and post op icu monitoring so that we uh, we can also along with the services we can cut down the cost related to critical care by this there are some objective assessment to identify high risk patients in terms of age gender surgical status like whether this is an emergency surgery or not associated comorbidities like charlson comorbidity index or a bup bup operative severity score by this we try to monitor or try to predict the icu characteristics of post op course of these patients in terms of sap score length of icu stay ventilator stay ventilator days requirement for renal replacement therapy cardiovascular support or overall hospital stay but when you look at this subgroup of patients patient who doesn't require icu usually do have, do have a good outcome patients who are coming to icu for post op monitoring of this is obvious these patients are high risk so they are usually have a poorer outcome in terms of icu admission and overall survival but beside this if patients who have initially gone to ward and eventually come to icu because of an acute deterioration or critical condition they usually do worse the the mortality is significantly high in these subgroup of patients and this is true for the whole cohort of the surgery cal population also for the high risk population and if we can see that the 30 days mortality one year mortality four year mortality everything is significantly high in this subgroup who initially has gone to the ward and eventually require indirect icu admission for a acute condition this is also true for surgery specific surgeries like elective colorectal surgery or emergency major vascular surgery this data also shows that all post operative complications are not reversible or and not preventable because we can see that significant number of patients who are initially coming to icu and receiving optimal monitoring still have acute deterioration and having a poor outcome in certain scenario this has been replicated in multiple studies this is another study from bj which is focused mainly on the major gastrointestinal surgeries and the liver surgery 
that is our subgroup of patient in this presentation, they also find that patients who are coming from ward due to acute deterioration in the post-operative period did worse with a very significantly high mortality compared to the direct patient who are coming to ICU. Now, how we can predict that which patient is going to do poor in the post-operative outcome? There are different objective scores which try to predict mortality and also morbidity like ASA, Apache 2, or POSUM, PPOSUM scores. Some of them include the, does not include the operative information and some include the operative information. It is obvious that if the surgical scores is stormy, if you include the operative information, operative forces into your prediction, probably they will be more, of, more correct to predict the post-operative complications or post-operative outcome. Among this, I want to specifically mention one or two, like PPOSUM or POSUM, which includes both preoperative and operative parameters. It includes physiological parameters like age, cardiac and respiratory history, blood pressure, some laboratory findings like hemoglobin and WBC. At the same time, it includes the operative parameters like operative severity, multiple procedure, blood loss, and mode of surgery and presence of malignancy. And what they do, usually they monitor the post-operative complications by Clavendindo classification. It, it, it is expanded from grade one to grade five, where grade one is a minor complication, grade four is organ dysfunction, either single organ or multiple organ, and grade five is death of the patient. But we need to remember in this scenario that this scoring system, though predict outcome, the relationship is not linear. Also the predicted morbidity changes with time. Now this is a score which is developed around 20 years ago. Now in last 20 years, because of improved post-operative out management, because of better anesthesia facility, more non-invasive or minimally invasive surgeries like laparoscopic surgery, or robotic surgery, the final outcome is progressively improving. This is also replicated in one of the studies we done in Tata Medical Center. When you look at the validity of PUPOSUM in adult cancer surgery, and we found that PUPOSUM over predicts morbidity. But the interesting finding is that if we took patients where they paid PUPOSUM of more than 60, the major complications is significantly high in this subgroup of patients. And it helps us to identify the highest patients who probably need a post-operative isocritical care monitoring in terms of anticipated complication. Now, if we go to the surgical profile, antibiotic profile as during surgery, the target is to prevent surgical site infection. So the recommendation is to give antibiotics within one hour. And the guidelines of, or the suggestion of antibiotics should be as per the published guideline, and it should be discontinued within 24 hours after surgery. And if you look at the, our subgroup, that is the upper GI surgery and hepatobiliary surgery, as per who the recommendation is either cefazolin or cefuroxin, and the second line is probably amoxifilab, or gentamicin or metronidazole. But at the same time, we need to remember that what are the bugs we like to cover? These are the basically entry gram negative bacteria or enterococcus. In a country like India, where the progress drug resistance is a reality, in our regular practice, and there is a significant increase in ESBL in our, in, among our bugs, we need to review our antibiotic policy as per our hospital protocol. And if there is a chance of or any clinical finding of clinical failure in terms of new development of sepsis, we need to escalate our antibiotics. So there are times our surgical profile axis may not be able to com combat against this gram-resistant bacteria. Now, another very interesting component is ERAS that has been developed in the last few years, that is enhanced recovery after surgery to decrease the post-operative surgical complication, that to decrease the post-operative ICU stay, and to have this patient have a better post-operative outcome. This has been developed as a first-start multimodal management uh, technique, which, which includes some intervention, along with non-invasive surgical technique like laparoscopy. And they try to decrease the post-operative hospital stay, but also to improve the post-operative quality of life in terms of better pain control, better toleration of the solid food, absence of nausea, vomiting, easy passage of stool, better mobilization in the post-operative period and access early discharge. This initially has been started in colorectal surgery, but now this principle has been now been implemented 
in different surgical interventions like pancreatectomy, hepatectomy, gastrectomy, and also urogenital surgeries. And they have shown to have a better outcome in terms of postoperative recovery. What are the components of EDAS in the postoperative post period? One is oxygen therapy. We'll come to that. Monitoring in a low risk patient, probably in the routine monitoring. High risk patient who is hemodynamically unstable may need some semi invasive continuous monitoring. Analgesia, fluid therapy, antibiotic prophylaxis. They also recommended if the surgery is prolonged, that is more than three hours, probably you need a second dose of antibiotic. Prevention of deep vein thrombosis, which is a very important component in the postoperative management that can be done with an low molecular heparin like enoxaparin or deltaparin. Glycemic control is important to decrease the chances of infection. Nasostic tube and should be removed as early as possible and patients should be allowed oral feed to have a better compliance. Drains should be removed by 48 hours and patients need to be mobilized within eight hours on priority. So these interventions, if we target on a regular basis, they may give a better outcome in the post-operative period. Now, in terms of oxygen therapy, the understanding is that if you give supplemental oxygen empirically in every patient in the post-op, probably they are going to have lesser chance of infection and less nausea vomiting. But the meta-analysis has shown that if we include studies which has low overall risk of bias, there is no significant improvement with supplemental oxygen. At the same time, there are associated toxic complications related to oxygen delivery. Now, intravenous fluid is probably the most discussed entity in our post-operative period, post-operative management. If you look at the options, it is the colloid and the crystalloid. In colloids, we have options like hydroxyethyl starch or volumen, now along with albumin. The non-albumin colloids has significantly lost its role in our regular practice, and gradually their use has been restricted. If some center are using it, they're also using it in a restricted volume or in a limited amount, maybe 15 to 10 ml or 15 ml per kg at max. The options among the crystalloids are balanced solutions like plasma light or ringer lactate solution along with a normal saline. Now, what are the advantages of balance or solution in a post-surgical patients? There is more physiological in composition, less acidosis, lower incidence of renal failure and renal replacement therapy, and there's a decreased post-operative complications in terms of organ dysfunction and morbidity. And if you look at the normal cell line, among the all other complications, the metabolic and renal component is significant and it is proved beyond doubt that with a larger volume of normal cell and it causes hyperchromic metabolic acidosis, it causes renal dysfunction, renal vasoconstriction, decreases renal blood flow, and renal to poor tissue, renal tissue perfusion. So we can see that normal cell line, though the name says, it is not so normal. And also the British Consciousness Guideline for intravenous fluid therapy in adult surgical patients has clearly mentioned that because of risk of inducing hyperchromic acidosis, balance or solution is the choice. Even if you want to replace free water by either a uh, dextrose containing fluid or half normal saline, you should be very, very cautious. And it is not appropriate for, to use it as a resuscitation or replacement fluid. Balance or solution should be considered as a replacement for blood loss. And also in situations there is when there is severe inflammation, such as infection, peritonitis, pancreatitis, and burn, and then it should be your drug of choice along with a colloid like albumin. And it has been proved in multiple studies when it has been compared with normal saline, and it has shown that balance of solution is required in a lesser volume, less chance of lactic acidosis, length, length duration of hospital stay, and lesser chance of renal support in terms of dialysis. It also shows that the diesel is significantly more with normal saline in terms of hyperchloremia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, and worse than acid based equilibrium and higher chance of renal injury proved by Engel. Also shows that there is higher chance of anti-inflammatory mechanism triggered by this balance or solution compared to normal saline. Now, after the type of fluid, how much to give? Initially, this, this start our discussion with that, the, with the liberal fluid therapy. And gradually we have moved from liberal fluid therapy to restricted fluid therapy, but the reality is something in between. So there are concepts called zero balance therapy, when we try to keep the weight of the patient same before surgery and after surgery, we have understood that the concept of third pacing loss of fluid is probably not true. 
and which is probably a concept and no it doesn't have any practical role and along with that the pre operative dehydration has been managed by allowing this patient to take oral clear liquids nearly 2 hour up to 2 hour before surgery so that extra fluid that we have given in this name of this two replacement fluid are not practical at this moment so gradually we are trying to give more balanced or well directed fluid in our practice so whenever we are loading patients with this we have to maintain a balance and you to remember that if the patient is hypervolemic it will develop edema organ dysfunction and going to have poor outcome on the other hand if we go to the extremes of restricted fluid therapy the hypoperfusion organ damage is also going to cause renal dysfunction and poor organ failure along with this the concept of four phase of intravenous fluid therapy that was much more popularized in critical care is also applicable in surgical patients because during the surgery we usually either optimize those patient with fluid in the early post operative period we try to stabilize the organ perfusion by getting optimizing those fluids but once the surgical stress is gone we need to deescalate this the iv fluid we try to make them negative so that at the end of 5 to 7 days those patient should be volumic and should not have cumulative positive balance because the multiple studies have shown that cumulative positive balance is going to give a poor outcome and in terms of monitoring no specific hemodynamic monitoring has ever shown to have a better outcome it is the number or the understanding of those monitoring which we implemented into an intervention only then it will give an outcome and there is no optimal hemodynamic values or target that we can apply in every patient it has to change from case to case basis and we have to optimize our organ perfusion in our patients we need to remember that during the surgery the patients are sedated and paralyzed so lot of hemodynamic monitoring techniques like stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation as a guidance for fluid therapy which is is applicable but in post op patients when the patient is continuously breathing those are not applicable and but if options are there continuous measurement of hemodynamic variables are preferred rather than static variables now post operative pain management we have to be multimodal as we already discussed in eras that we need to cut down the opioids to patient have a better post operative outcome so the options are epidural we need to decide about the duration and the drug options are local anesthetic along with opioids or epidural morphine in resource risk constraint setting when you cannot give a continuous infusion epidural morphine can play a significant role we can go for a pca now for abdominal surgeries trans transverse abdomen is tap blocks are significantly coming along with along or along without a catheter besides paracetamol and nsaids has its role along with that different drug mod modulating agents can be used to decrease the requirement of this medicines this is the systemic review and meta analysis from jama which has compared the epidural along with pca and it has shown that though epidural has a better pain control in terms of uh, post operative postoperative outcome the final there is no evidence of improved re recovery or reduced morbidity when it compared with alternative analgesic techniques like pca now if you look at the post operative complications as i mentioned these are extensive surgeries and dealing with but which has a lot of bacteria so chances of sepsis is always there so whenever this patient develops a fever we need to differentiate that whether this fever is just inflammatory fever because of tissue handling or it is because of sepsis so it can be fever can be divided into immediate that is within few hours mostly it is because of surgical stress trauma or burn in our patient mostly because of tissue handling immune reactions can be there because of some medications or blood product sometimes malignant hyperthermia can present in the immediate post operative period and some predate infection which is predating the operation can present in the immediate post operative period early means first 3 days mostly it is sepsis sometimes myocardial infarction is also present with a fever and the late that is from day 4 to up to day 30 there are sepsis unless proved otherwise and the sources can be lower sp tract infection urinary tract infection surgical side infection or catheter associated infection sometimes drug reactions or venous thrombolysis can also present as fever but if someone has a fever after 30 days of surgery these are unlikely to be related to sepsis 
we already know from the third def international consensus definition of sepsis that it's a life threatening organ dysfunction leading to organ failure and when you are measuring it we usually monitor it in terms of organ failure or worsening organ function measured by sofa why it is important because compared to a simple infection sepsis that is associated with organ failure has a higher mortality by up to 10% and if the patient is in shock the mortality can go as high as 40% how we can approach it we call it a rat approach that is we have to recognize the sepsis by some general variables like fever hypothermia tachycardia tachypnea altered mental status or by some inflammatory variables like leukocytosis or leukopenia or plus c reactive protein high c reactive protein and high procalcitonin but we need to remember that these all findings are very common in the post surgical patients and it is not possible to differentiate sepsis from immediate post operative course by this nature so we need to fall on organ assessment that is if you look we need to look for organ dysfunction like hypoxia renal failure coagulation abnormality or ileus unexplained ileus thrombocytopenia hyperbilirubinemia or in evidence of tissue hypoperfusion like hyperlactitemia or decrease capillary refilling time now it next is to assess so we need to monitor the severity and monitor the whether with our intervention patients are improving or deteriorating that can be done by sofa scope we need to need some radiology like chest x ray and ct scan ct scan is very much important in case of intra abdominal sepsis to identify the source and for optimal source control and some laboratory parameters like complete blood count renal function electrolytes coagulation to monitor our organ function and to monitor the courses of sepsis based on treatment we just want to mention some salient points like fluid resuscitation early vasopressor is very important to maintain optimal perfusion abg in terms of monitoring lactate and to monitor for the lactate clearance a persistently high lactate even after doing every intervention indicate a poor outcome we need to send appropriate culture early appropriate antibody need to be sent started along with optimal source control and to ensure optimal tissue perfusion we got to go for guided hemodynamic monitoring like echo or some invasive monitor along with some stage dose steroid if the hemodynamics is persistently poor the supportive cares of first aid bid is always important to keep the patient to provide optimal care to our patient now there are different complications which can happen in our patient and we need to understand those organ function so that we can support them properly post operative pulmonary complication is probably the most common organ dysfunction in terms of pneumonia in terms of post operative atelectasis or exacerbation of copd and asthma and if you try to optimize or identify the subgroup of patients who have a higher chance of post operative pulmonary complication there are some scoring system like ariscat gupta or adazola it includes patient some criteria including patient dependent factors like age ace score cop underlying copd poor sensorium preoperative saturation significant weight loss of preoperative sepsis or some procedure related uh, factors like elective or emergency surgery what is the duration of surgery and what is the type of surgical procedures like i can give you as an example that in in uh, crs or cytoreductive surgeries there is extensive diaphragmatic stripping happen because of removal because for removal of the cancer and as a result of that those patients have a post operative diaphragmatic dysfunction leading to basal atelectasis and higher chance of infection since there are studies in ngm published in ngm that has shown that just like critically ill patients which need to follow low tidal volume high pp ventilation even in anesthesia patient during their main prolonged surgery this is called improved trial and it has shown to have a better outcome in terms of post operative pulmonary complications and hospital stay and ventilator stay and the primary outcome is clearly better in patients who has a lung protective ventilation with a 6 ml per kg of tidal volume along with a peep of 8 6 8 cm of water and what are the ways to prevent post operative pulmonary complications some are pre operative interventions like incentive spirometry to increase the respiratory reserve oral care with chloroxidine gluconate solution has shown to decrease infection because they usually decrease the chances of resistant gram negative bacterial colonization in our pharynx post operative interventions like instant immediate instant spirometry from from the day one post operative oral care with chloroxidine gluconate solution along with 
uh, some other simple interventions like keep the head end of the patient by 30 degree unless there is a contraindication early mobilization or make the patient sit outside in the chair is also shown to have a better pulmonary function and decrease chances of post operative pulmonary complications now post operative cardiovascular complications there is a significant diagnostic challenges in diagnosing post operative cardiac complications specifically if you are talking about myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction because if you look at the diagnosis of ami then you will see there have to be a certain criteria like rise in significant uh, level of tropi more than 99 percentile which can be happen in post op patients up to 10 to 15 percent cases there can be should be symptoms of ischemia which is unlikely because of post operative analgesia new stt changes or new onset lvpp pathological cues are very difficult to pick up in a post op period new onset regional wall motion abnormality is also very difficult to pick up because we are not doing screening echocardiography in every patient and intracoronary thrombus identification by angiography is not possible because these patients rarely go for an angio even if they have a hemodynamic instability or cardiac issue another challenge is perioperative acute renal injury so there will be some patient related factors like male age chronic kidney disease hypertension cardiovascular disease some procedural related factors like use, use of intravenous contrast use of diuretics and vasopressors invasive procedures intraoperative hemodynamic instability significant blast loss intraoperative blood transfusion large amount of colloid in the perioperative period all these things make our patients prone for post operative uh, renal dysfunction even in the, there is in case of abdominal surgery anastomotic leak intraabdominal sepsis abdominal hypertension also makes our patients more prone for renal dysfunction and if the patient has a preoperative renal compromise like ckd or decrease in the gfr they have a higher chance of post operative renal renal complication so what are the options how we can prevent acute kidney injury one we have always discussed which is better to use the balance salt solution avoid colloid like hydroxyethyl starch fluid management need to be optimized you need to ensure optimal tissue perfusion in this regard intraoperative urine output can guide us in terms of perfusion but if the patient is on diuretics or, in, or if the patient has going for a restricted fluid therapy sometimes it is very challenging it is better to avoid diuretics unless the patient has a clear evidence of volume overload we need to restrict the uh, blood transfusion in the perioperative period better to go for hemoglobin or optimization in the preoperative period in terms of hemodynamics goal we have to avoid low map even for a shorter period of time if the patient has a chronic hypertension we need to target a higher map because those patients are habituated in a higher perfusion pressure along with there is some evidence of dopexamine in the post operative uh, to prevent post operative renal dysfunction but the data is very very limited but the low dose dopamine has no longer any role as a renal protective molecule and should not be recommended it is better to avoid drugs like aminoglycosides or nsaids in these patients if there is an alternative and safer option post operative delirium the post operative delirium is not very common in abdominal surgery but there i need to mention some of the points in terms of non pharmacological intervention that is applicable in every patient every surgical patients in terms of identification of the high risk sub group like old patient who has an underlying dementia past history of delirium in previous surgery any medical history of psychiatric drug intake poor eyesight or hearing or patient is really frail and need to do some active non pharmacological intervention to prevent development of delirium like active mobilization of those patients optimal pain control giving the glasses and hearing aids to the early expose them to the sunlight or the daylight so that they understand what is day and night communicate with them properly in terms of their issues and in terms of the intervention that we are going to do with them review their chronic medications we need to start them very early and at the same time if the patient has developed delirium we should actively search for the medical cause along with pharmacological management to prevent hyperactive delirium either by using risperidone or quetiapine so this is another another challenging issue in abdominal surgery which is called hypex what we have done here after the cytodeductive surgery there is a heated chemotherapy that has been given into the abdomen for 60 to 90 minutes 
And during that time, this chemotherapy, because of high temperature, they usually penetrate better into the, into the tumors and has give them a better outcome. If we look at the post-operative challenges, this is our consensus guideline. I have also been privileged to contribute into it. So these patients, because of the extensive surgeries, usually need elective intubation and ventilation in the post-operative period. And usually then the next day, they usually get extubated once the hemodynamics is stable and the active inflammatory component has been settled down. In the post-operative period, we need to monitor them for mean arterial pressure, heart rate, urine output, and we have to guide to it as per our tissue, uh, as per our, uh, tissue perfusion or evidence of. In this situation, lactate-guided fluid therapy, though recommended, is not very dependent because lactate may be high because of inflammation and because of hyperthermia. And also, even in this subgroup, unless there is a gastrectomy or extensive bowel handling, we also suggest for early nutritional so that or parenteral therapy because these patients are usually cachectic and they usually have a very significant catabolic phase in the next five to seven days. So to conclude, surgical post-operative management of major abdominal surgeries is a very, very vast entity. I try to touch a few of the important topics, which is very much relevant in all of our regular practice. But as I mentioned that surgical critical care is a very unrecognized entity till in, even in India. And we need to educate people. We need to share more information, share knowledge with each other so that we can develop this specialty for our better outcome of our patients. By this, I'd like to conclude my presentation. And again, I'd like to thank Dr. Maidi and uh, Mega Academic Platform for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Dr. Sudetta, uh, it is really very uh, exciting and a very interesting lecture. And uh, uh, the way you conducted your lecture is absolutely fascinating uh, manner. Uh, it, uh, it revealed that you have extensive uh, experience in um, post operative um, intensive care unit, and uh, you uh, you have handled the, the patients from coming to the from operating room to uh, ICU from the ward the post operatively, and all the problem in the post operative uh, time like infection, fluid management, and uh, pain medicine, and all of these absolutely fascinating experience. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, our our colleague Muhammad Sulaiman, he is usually um, one of the challenging um, uh, colleague. He's asking any study evaluating TIVA in major uh, surgery versus uh, conventional anesthesia as a most operative care. It is purely an aesthetic question. I'm not sure. Uh, do you have this answer? Yes, I think uh, this is a purely anesthesia related question. And as I'm not practicing anesthesia at this moment, I'm not the right person. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I believe uh, TIVA is, uh, is now in the last uh, 10, 15 years, and it is very well famous as regards the very good established most over the fair pain uh, practice and a very good recovery and all of this stuff. But just uh, in, in major surgery, we have to consider a uh, different factor, mainly the surgeon, the patient, the surgery itself, how they handle a uh, major surgery and now evolving techniques like robotic assistant surgery, which is far um, easier than uh, normal open surgery in the most of the uh, care. What are your recommendations to optimize transfer of such patient from CETA to ICU? Uh, so, as I mentioned that, because in a country like us, the ICU beds are very limited. So it is better to optimize those or identify the high risk patients who has a higher chance of complications and need better monitoring. As I mentioned, if the patient requiring post-operative ventilation, definitely they need ICU monitoring Patient is hemodynamically unstable, requiring noradrenaline, need ICU monitoring. Along with that, if the patient has very high risk factors like underlying cardiac issues, significant respiratory issues, they also need ICU monitoring. And some patients who are coming from the world to the ICU, either because of post-operative bleeding or maybe post-operative sepsis, anastomotic leak, 
or maybe in perioperative MI. These are the four or five sub or, or some postoperative pulmonary complications like a pneumonia. This type of patients, when, uh, when develop an organ dysfunction, they usually come to ICU for a better mouth management. Uh, he has here another uh, question. I, I believe it is, uh, again, I'm not sure is it intensive care or anesthesia question. What is the role of dexamethidine or clonidine? Um, yeah, in terms I think of you can answer that. Dexamethidine I am using mainly in the post-op patients for weaning. A lot of post-op patients, when you start to stop metazolam or propofol, they become very irritable, mainly because maybe mm -hmm. because of the underlying some drug dependence or sometimes they wake up very fast. So in those situations, it is very, it is more comfortable for the patient if we start, stop with those medicines and start dexamethidine, continue dexamethidine during the weaning period and gradually extubate them while the dexamethidine is going on. So this patient usually become less delirious, try to obey command better, and that extubation process is usually smooth compared to without any, without any, without dexamethidine. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you, you, you touch a very good important point as regards the monitoring and the optimization of the patient and every patient should be individualized. Uh, you know, that, that's extremely important as you look after the patient inside the operating room because I work mainly in theater. Uh, every patient should be individualized. So uh, optimized as regards the uh, arterial blood pressure, as regards the central venous pressure, fluid balance, and the antibiotics. So all of this stuff as regards the patient, you know, to, should be better outcome because all of the people now are working at a better outcome rather than only uh, I have a good blood pressure, I have a, a good ventilation. So at the end of the day, you have a better outcome for the patient rather. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank we need you. to the patient as a whole and have to support organ organs and address all the challenges as I have mentioned. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sudetta Mukherjee. And uh, that is fascinating uh, lecture for uh, most of the care. And now, uh, if you allow me to uh, go to uh, different, uh, the other star for tonight, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nasr uh, for his. Uh, for the second lecture. Uh, he is going to talk to us about a very operative endocrine emergency. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nasr is a Cairo University graduate as a general practitioner. He worked for a few years uh, in Palestine camps in Lebanon, and uh, Lebanon tonight is lighted with the Egyptian gas. Thank you so much for the Egyptian uh, government. And uh, he is graduated as an anesthesiologist at the American University in Beirut. He got uh, anesthesia fellowship from Ireland. I'm so proud of that because I work in Ireland and then based on Ireland here. And he is followed by the pediatric anesthesia fellowship from Canada. He is a multiple achiever, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nas. is a role model as an anesthetist and uh, uh, a teacher and the clinician. Uh, then he test work in Saudi Arabia. He worked in the best uh, uh, institution in Saudi Arabia, King Faisal. A specialist hospital in Riyadh, and it is a research center as well. Finally, he settled in the UK. He can't grieve the, the Western society. And for the last 15 years, he's a consultant in and working in HNHS. Uh, his last case working in the Royal uh, Gramson Hospital was a laboratory for patients with the pacemaker. Uh, today, he is going to um, please us with his fascinating lecture in the very operative endocrine emergency. Allow me to welcome Dr. Ahmed Amin Nasr for this program. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Saad, for your efforts. And also, great thanks to Dr. Mukherjee for his scholarship and uh, uh, wonderful lecture he gave us tonight. And uh, I'm going to start from where he ended. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add something for these things, which should be, should not be left unspoken of. So it is endocrinal emergencies. We should all speak of that because sometimes it goes unnoticed and things bad could happen. Hormones regulate total biological processes in the body. False at production 
rate of these hormones, high or low, could create life-threatening emergencies and may wreck the whole machinery. Dr. So Ahmed, would you be kind to share your screen, please? Am I not sharing my screen? No, not yet. Not yet. Oh, I sure. I thought oh. I I had. I oh. would be grateful if you start from the beginning. Thank okay. you. So okay. Now Thank here you. we go. Share. Thank you. Now, is it shared? Yes, thank you. Thank you so oh, much. Okay, so everything's fine, but you, you heard me from the start, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we, we come back to hormones, as, is, as we said, that it regulates the total biological processes and the total existence of human beings in certain amounts, very small amounts directly in the circulation, which reach every cell in the body. Now, any faults at production rate would cause problems. And today we are going to have a glimpse of each and every hormone. So let us go through the story of this pregnant lady. She is a 35 year old lady, 65 kilogram in body weight. She's gravity six, para three. She's got managed hypertension for 10 years under acibutalol and methyl dopa. And uh, blood pressure was maintained between 130 over 80 to 160 over 100, which is uh, pretty much control. However, at her obstetric visits at 36 weeks of gestation, it proved to be an acute turn during her pregnancy because her blood pressure skyrocketed to 245 over 134 and her heart rate was 62. It was noted that there's no proteinuria, no weight gain, no edema, no liver, nor, nor coagulation abnormalities. Moreover, poor fetal movements was feared and intrauterine growth retardation expected. So in consideration of her persistent hypertension and oligohydramnus, IUGR, an emergency cesarean section was arranged. While she was receiving the spinal anesthetics, her blood pressure was very high up with positioning to 236 over 137 and heart rate about 70 per minute. She received spinal anesthesia, 11 milligram of pipivacaine and successful sensory block came up to T5 and T6. Now, her blood pressure after spinal anesthetics was amazingly very high, 260 over 145 millimeter mercury, and her heart rate was 75 per minute. She received some medications for that, nicardipine one milligram, which didn't do a lot. However, it kind of, brought down the blood pressure to 170 over 100 millimeter mercury, which was a good achievement. With delivery and, you know, the pressure of getting the baby out, her, again, blood pressure went high up to 220 over 130 millimeter mercury and her heart rate was 130 per minute she received hydralazine, 10 milligram, because of that. She kept hypertensive all through surgery. In the recovery room, amazingly, her blood pressure was still high, 230 over 145. Even her heart rate was going up to 160 per minute. However, she did not complain of any discomfort and even she started bonding with her baby. However, because of this unexpected wild rise of blood pressure, theochromocytoma was kind of a um, uh, diagnosis which can cause all these problems. 
And that's why she was transferred to intensive care unit for more care and more observation. And cardiology was consulted. However, when she arrived at intensive care unit, they changed the possible diagnosis from fake chromocytoma to essential hypertension with acute crisis because she maintained her high blood pressure to 249 over 160. So they started continuous labetalol infusion, which apparently did some trick and her blood pressure dropped to 90 over 84 and the heart rate came down to 100. And 28. So they stopped labetalol and even started uh, dopamine after that. However, one hour later, she developed cardiac collapse, ventricular fibrillation for which CPR was conducted. Unfortunately, she died within 40, after 48 hours. Post resuscitation CT showed retroperitoneal mass located between pancreatic head and inferior vena cava, which was confirmed, confirmed uh, uh, post mortem to be a fake chromocytoma. So, what we are having here is unexplained wild blood pressure. A higher blood pressure after spinal anesthetics, B, maintained high blood pressure in recovery room while patient is not in pain, C, in theater, in ICU as well, the high blood pressure, and the strange response to labetalol infusion. So the take home message from this case is that whenever you have unexplained wild blood pressure, always think pheochromocytoma. I know it's rare. However, it's, always, it's also rare to get such resistant, persistent high blood pressure unexplained for. And whenever the second lesson, whenever it is pheochromocytoma, you have to go alphabetically alpha blockers and beta blockers after blocking the alpha receptors. If we start as they did in intensive care unit by putting her on labetalol infusion, you are strangulating the heart against the vasoconstricted after load. So unexplained high blood pressure, think fail. And if you think fail, go alphabetically. Here we go, another case, and another unexplained wild blood pressure. A 75 year old woman undergoing robotic assisted laparoscopic hysterectomy and tumor debulking. She developed severe persistent hypertension after just a small dose of methylene blue, so severe that she needed 48 hours of intensive care admission. And in that case, with further evaluation, they discover that the patient had undiagnosed pheochromocytoma. So unexplained wild blood pressure and secondary to methylene blue injection can lead as well to hypertensive emergency and also evaluation or further evaluation for pheochromocytoma. Now, in this case, the jury is not out yet, and we didn't know so far whether the high blood pressure was secondary to manipulation, robotic manipulation of the tumor, or precipitated by injection of methylene blue. We all know that methylene blue could raise blood pressure, but is methylene blue friend or foe? Can we use this 
character of methylene blue for the sake of patience? Well, pre-isolation, when you do phacromocytoma, phacromocytoma resection tumor, you have two phases, pre-isolation, pre-isolation of the tumor. So all what you need to do, you go alphabetically, you block the alpha receptors and beta receptors. And the more successful in blocking alpha and beta receptors, the more you will be in trouble when you remove the tumor because patient can go into severe hypotensive collapse post-isolation. Here we go. Methylene blue could prove to be a friend in this case because it raises the blood pressure by a different mechanism. Anti-nitric oxide, either directly or even prevention of nitric oxide production. So simply what we do in post-isolation, you go alphabetically. And as a matter of fact, Amin Nasser et al. had described using methylene blue to prevent post-operative or post-isolation collapse. And it worked very well. And there are many reports now using methylene blue to prevent post-resection or post-isolation hypotension. However, you use that as a sort of first line of treatment. So go alphabetically again, methylene blue, then norepinephrine, and if both don't work, so you can use vasopressin. With fair chromocytoma, I should insist, it is hemodynamics, not anesthetics. Whatever anesthesia you can give, and I assure you, all anesthetics were used to treat phacromocytoma resection. However, it is the hemodynamics that make differences. And the best way is to look for preload, afterload, heart rate, rhythm, and stroke volume optimization. Pre isolation, alpha and beta blocker and fluid load of this patient. At no time, these patients should be underloaded. Also, at no time, this patient should be vasoconstricted. In post-operative or post-resection, you look for, again, methylene blue as your first choice to prevent post-resection hypotension followed by norepinephrine or vasopressin. Another case of hypotension, which is lacking steroid stress hormones in Addisonian crisis, severe hypotension, besides hypoalertness, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, all are going low in face of stress, they should have been going high. No, opposite to that, they go low. The only thing which can go high is potassium as a sort of a harbinger of dying organism while facing stress. Imagine JFK failure at Anticaster Cuba invasion secondary to hypoalertness and delayed steroid injection. Well, we can say thank God for that. He didn't succeed in invasion. However, it was just either the delay of steroid injection or market hypotension and affection or affecting his mental power. Hypotension, circulatory collapse, weakness, fatigue, lethargy, altered mental status, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia with severe dehydration, 
hyperkalemia. So in facing stress, whenever you had adrenal insufficiency, lack of glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, you can go low, except potassium as high. And the treatment would be just injection. And you can do, you can go and invade anywhere you would like. Now, hypoglycemia, it's a real dire, life-threatening emergency. Lack of energy, fuel supply to brain and nervous system. This is manifestation of brain about to fail, altered mental status, coma, convulsions, neurodeficit. And brain, while appealing for lifeline, top stress hormone, adrenaline released with hyperadrenergic symptoms. And the treatment is sugar, just sugar. Bring life back and give sugar. How much you give sugar? Half of body weight in grams. Now you can use 50%, 25%, 10%. It depends how fast you would like to go or how much water you would like to add and how the veins are small or, or big. Of course, you have to do that as fast as possible to prevent death. Time is neurons. Hypoglycemia causes death of neurons. So you have to be as quick as that to prevent this. On the other side, hyperglycemia could be diabetic ketoacidosis, which is another life-threatening condition. Secondly, to lack of insulin. So glucose is underused and blood is too sweet, too loaded with sugar. However, this sugar cannot be used because of lack of insulin. So there is hyperglycemia, hyperosmolarity, dehydration, and polyuria. And on the other side, you will find that the metabolism is shifted towards usage of fat with the result of ketosis and acidosis. And again, because of the brain problems with underused dextrose, altered mental status will be on top of the list of clinical picture. And the rest will be secondary to hyperosmolar dehydration in acidosis. However, hyperglycemia could be different, could be just hyperglycemia, especially in elderly. We don't know why. In certain cases, there's only rise of blood sugar in the body without, it's non ketotic non-acidotic, just hypersmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic syndrome. Now, whatever type of hyperglycemia, the treatment could be first, fluid resuscitation. Secondly, to dehydration, you have to do, start with fluid resuscitation. So, The, the most critical part of treating patients with hyperglycemia is fluid resuscitation. Intravenous solutions replace extravascular and intravascular fluids and electrolyte losses. They also dilute both the glucose level and the level of circulating counter-regulatory hormones. Only when you are sure of fluid resuscitation, you start insulin in order to shift the metabolic status into the anabolic rather than the catabolic one. And you give insulin very small amount. You can kind of easy on insulin. By the way, problems with hyperglycemia, mostly during treatment, if it had been diagnosed early. So you give 0.1 unit per kilo per hour initially, and as blood sugar started, starts to normalize, you give two to three units per hour. That would be followed by electrolyte correction. 
especially potassium. Hyperglycemia and then insulin treatment would shift potassium to and fro. So you have to make sure that you follow the potassium level in these cases. Thyroxine plays a crucial metabolic role in all body cells, tissues, and organs. In excess, thyro thyroxine intoxicated puts life on fire. Accelerated infusions, tachycardia, atrofibrillation. By the way, in any case of atrofibrillation, you have to check over thyroxine level. That's one third of cases of atrofibrillation is secondary to problems with thyroxine. Altered mental status, anxiety, hyperadrenergic, heat production and intolerance. Emergency treatment is just beta blockers, very simple. One time I got a case in the morning and the patient had received his thyroxine early at home, but when he came to, the, to uh, holding bay, he received another dose of thyroxine. He went into atrofibrillation. It would have been easier for me to cancel this case because of atrofibrillation. However, just be the blocker treated this atrofibrillation and things would be fine. Because thyroxine, in order to work, it will work through beta receptors. So if you block beta receptors, you're not going to change the level of thyroxine, but you're going to change the effect of thyroxine. So be the blocker is the password in cases of thyrotoxicosis. While hypometabolism, now imagine thyroxine being the body thermostat. And can you turn it down now? As if going in the direction of absolute zero of Kelvin, life as we know it slows down and eventually stops. Slow. Everything goes slow with mixedema or with hypometabolism or hypothyroidism, bradycardia bradypnea, hypotension, brain sluggish, apathy, coma, heat is stolen from the body, water entrapped leading to edema, cold production and intolerance. It is uncommon for very obvious reasons nowadays. However, the treatment is, of course you know it, T4 or T3. The difference between T4 and T3, T4 works after being transformed into T3, so it takes some time, which actually is, is not a bad thing because you don't want to overwhelm hypometabolized organs immediately with T3. However, you can use T3 as well, but in smaller amount. Finally, endocrine emergencies can be forgotten. Endocrine emergencies are those things which should not be left unspoken for. However, it started with unexplained altered mental status, hypertension or hypotension, bradycardia or tachycardia, bradypnea or tachypnea. And you can decipher all these things from the vital signs, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure. But today I'm going to ask you to put blood sugar as the fifth vital sign, because then you will not, you will never miss hypoglycemia nor hyperglycemia. Remember that, embrace it. It will make you proud one day. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, what should I say, um, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nasser, uh, uh, a role model uh, speaker, and uh, he is tonight uh, shed light on um, many, many, many issues we face interoperatively, uh, starting with obstetric emergencies, 
um, co-incidence of five chromosome hypertension with uh, pregnancy. And we got um, a comment here from my dear professor, Saha Marzouk, it is outstanding presentation. I think that's enough for me to say that. Thank and you. Uh, <laughs> um, we we moved. You moved very very confidently and very swiftly to other uh, emergencies during anesthesia, like uh, hypo and the hyperglycemia, hypo and the hyperthyroidosis, thyroidosis, uh, other issues. Uh, it's extremely important uh, to 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 know all of these emergencies and how to deal with them. Um, I think I, I, I might have one uh, question here from our uh, excellent colleague, Dr. Mohammed Salim. Did sodium nitroside have a role in pyrochromocytoma patient? Well, I mean, to be honest, uh, I wouldn't say yes or no. All medications have been tried. Everything had been tried, to be honest. I mean, um, any drug could be metabol uh, could be used. However, <laughs> it is the hemodynamics. You start with vasodilators before a beta blocker. That's the whole thing. And also, the more you, I mean, to be honest, with pre-isolation hypotension, all what you need, I mean, to, uh, sodium nitroxide could be the best drug because of its uh, uh, duration of action. That, all right, when you stop it, it will go away. So then you can uh, prevent post-isolation hypotension. But uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't commit myself to anything. I, I go as my, what I formulated, the principle I formulated, it is a hemodynamics rather than anesthetics is the hemodynamics and you have to follow certain uh, arrangement for this uh, hemodynamics. That's all. I mean, um, of course, if he wants to use sodium nitroxide, it is, could be used. Any, any vasodilators could be used. I mean, uh, is it uh, there? Is it ready? Can you find it anywhere? Maybe hydrazine could be easier uh, option uh, maybe uh, you can use it, but I mean, it, it is not, if you review management, uh, uh, operative management of, of heochromocytoma, nothing is the par excellence or the one which should be used. Anything could be used. Sodium nitroxide could be used. Others could be used. And actually, I would like to add a, a very important point, which you outlined that point very carefully, which is starting alpha blockers before beta blockers. That's absolutely um, very detrimental yeah. in the management of the hypertension during chromophysitoma. It is obsolete. It is forbidden to start beta blocker before alpha blocker because you strangulate the heart and uh, you uh, you stop the, the heart beating uh, against uh, high uh, uh, upper load. Um, uh, another, lecture, another question here, can you please give some example of differential diagnosis issues that might confuse with such events? I don't know if it, we, we need to start the lecture again, you know? So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, no, no, it's a good question. However, however, the, the whole exercise, the whole exercise is just to, remind you by the fact that whenever it is unexplained high blood pressure, whatever the reason is, you should put phacromocytoma on top of the list. Only for using alpha blocker before beta blockers. Before, because if you say, all right, like, like these people in ICU, they said, no, it's not phacromocytoma. It is essential hypertension with acute crisis. And they gave the beta block and they actually I mean, the patient, they lost the patient second to do that. So I can give you differential diagnosis of all cases of hypertension. However, yeah. uh, to be honest, if you find a hypertension, which is that persistent and you give spinal anesthesia, instead of going low, it goes high. You, you take the baby out and instead of going low, it, it goes high. You go to recovery room, patient is not in pain. Patient has got no reason. It is not preeclampsia. And I, I, assu I assume that I said, 
there is no noted weight gain, proteinuria, edema, uh, liver uh, abnormalities, coagulation abnormalities. So it is not preeclampsia. It is, it's not essential hypertension. Even if it was essential hypertension, you still can say safely, it might be fulcrum cytoma, and I'm going to use it you could, because you cannot do anything more. You're, you're not going to do something specific. The only specific things is that when things go okay, then you go for further investigation and you check, you do CT, you do whatever uh, MRI, whatever uh, 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 X-ray diagnosis you want to exclude fake chromosome. Once you exclude fake chromosome, go for anything else. But it's a good question as well. Uh, I would like to say, to remind my colleagues as well, because basically we are physician, we are clinician, we are a practitioner before being an anesthesiologist. So we have to have this um, differential diagnosis. We have to have uh, an idea how to manage um, uh, resistant hypertension or refractory hypertension or bleeding or whatever uh, uh, situation we have during anesthesia. Uh, we cannot, uh, you know, for every single problem, we will call for another doctor to manage like cardiologist, hematologist, and all this stuff. So we have to have an idea how to manage those emergency situations. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Amin Nasr and Dr. Uh, Sudetta Mukherjee, tonight our stars for this uh, webinar. I think uh, this added to my success tonight to host those eminent speakers tonight to talk about very, very interesting topic and uh, touching everyday basis. And uh, we, we see those problems every day uh, from post-operative care, problem during uh, admission to intensive care, and the variable issues we need to optimize to another issues during interoperative period like uh, endocrine emergencies, uh, you know, diabetes and the very operative time, post-operative care, the interoperative as well, and the other unanticipated issues like uh, cytotoxicosis crisis, malignant hyperthermia, bleeding and uh, hypertension, all of these issues, we need to be aware about that. We couldn't find any better speaker than uh, our stars tonight, Dr. Zadetta Mukherjee and Dr. Ahmed And thank you very much, our attendees tonight, our colleagues, eminent colleagues, uh, you are behind this uh, excellent uh, success. And uh, thank you much. For, um, just to remind you before we go, uh, for uh, Thursday, Thursday, our Thursday, coming Thursday uh, webinar, and uh, we have, uh, you, you, I'm sure you see this presentation, we have a learning COVID webinar. Uh, our colleague from India, uh, you know him, he's a model, uh, role model speaker, Dr. Rajesh Mishra, and he's going to talk about our his experience in both the COVID-19 cardiopulmonary recovery and rehabilitation. It is uh, Thursday, nine o'clock Cairo time. And another speaker from UK, long sequelae of COVID-19 update and management, Dr. Yasser Naaman. He's actually my classmate, and he is consultant uh, respiratory medicine and uh, critical care in UK. This webinar will be exclusively uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Ahsina uh, Luva from uh, uh, Bangladesh. She's consultant intensive care in Bangladesh. I'm looking forward to see you, all of you, Thursday, 9 o'clock, uh, Cairo time. And thank you very much. And uh, 